Howdy, everyone, and welcome. My name is Adam Martin. I'm a political economy research fellow at the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight to introduce our speaker. Uh, before I do that, I've got a brief plug for our next event. Uh, Yongmi Park is an activist and writer that has a, 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 an activist that escaped from North Korea, and she's going to talk about what it was like um, to live in that sort of a society coming up on April 26th uh, here in Lubbock. So that just like this event, that'll be both live and uh, streamed online um, if you can't make it out that night. Um, so with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Bart Wilson. He is a chair of economics and law at Chapman University in California, where he is also the director of the Smith Institute for Political Economy and Philosophy. Uh, Bart started off as an experimental economist. Uh, but as you'll see, he has branched out quite a bit into philosophy, into linguistics, into law and biology. And his most recent book, The Property Species, draws on all those different disciplines to provide a new theory of what property is in human society. Uh, we tried to get him out last year, but due to the unfortunate circumstances we're all under, his, his visit got pushed back. We're very grateful uh, that he made the effort to come out just as soon as it was safe to do so. Uh, so without further ado, here's Mark Wilson. Thanks, Adam. Um, I want to thank Adam for the invitation to visit Lubbock. This is my first time to Lubbock, Texas. Uh, he, his hospitality has been grand. I've eaten a lot of great pieces of meat here. And uh, I want to thank the students and the faculty I've talked with. They had some great conversations and been quite welcoming to be back out here visiting the universities. I also want to thank Amanda and Tefa for all the behind the scenes work they did to make this visit work threw some extra wrenches into things beyond the normal COVID things, and so I very much appreciate it. I'll get on that. So this is a cover of the book. Uh, I asked an artist friend of mine, Gus Harper, to paint this particular painting. This was from, he painted it in 2019, and here's his previous piece that he did for me in 2010. Now, I want to take you through what you, how our mind works when we see a painting and what we do with it. So, in, in this is a painting. You'll notice that there are, um, it's blown up. It's even blown up at this big screen. But we recognize it as a pomegranate, which is something in the actual world like about this big. But our mind can see that it's been magnified and put that together. And even though, there are these one-inch spaces on the actual wall between them. Our mind just kind of collapses that and puts it all together, and we recognize it as a pomegranate. We also, if you are an art, you follow art, can see that his paintings, he has, this is a part of a series of his words, of fruits and plants, that they are icons reminiscent of Georgia O'Keeffe. She's done the same kind of thing with flowers and blown them up and it magnified them in, in, in her um, paintings. So our mind makes that connection to history as well. But then Gus does something really different and interesting here at the bottom, where it looks like the pomegranate is bleeding. And our mind imposes gravity. That's like pulling the stuff down. And so our mind did all of that work onto this thing. And it's that kind of work that our minds do to everyday things that I'm going to talk to you and explain to you my theory about how I think property works. So here's the actual painting without adulterating it with my title on, on it. And you'll recognize this is also related to the previous one. You'll notice that these kind of edges around here, around the, these figures, are similar to these little edges you'll then go around um, on the pomegranate. It's got that same kind of style to him that makes you recognize, even though the color tones palette is very different, it's cool here versus warm in the middle. It's the same guy. If you saw a bunch of these paintings around, you recognize there's a theme to it, even though you might not be able to put your words why that's the case. And what we do here, what's different about this painting, is he painted all of the stencils and the painting, and then the white is on top. He paints that. So what has he done? He's taken and created a form coming out of this, and our mind treats this whole thing as something, as one thing. 
output coming out. Whereas this, we're not quite sure. Is this a sphere or not? We see a point, but is it really? It's kind of hidden. We got, our mind has to, hasn't quite put that together. And it's this idea that we treat this whole thing here as a unit that's important to how property works. The other thing is that Gus painted this after reading the first three chapters of the book. And he added this little thing up here from, from reading that. The idea of a mind on the wall, which is reminiscent of those French cave paintings from 17,000 years ago. And what's true about those paintings? That our mind 17,000 years ago is being connected to a mind way, way in the past of history. Somehow his mind, or her mind, and our minds are in communication with each other. And property works the same way. That our minds are connected to people we don't even personally know. And so, we want to ask the question, what happens if this guy puts this spear down? Is he still one with it? So if you were a biologist, from Mars, you were looking at this planet and looking at this behavior of these creatures called Homo sapiens sapiens, who self-named themselves wisest of the wise. What would you notice about the relationship between people and their things that they use? From the Kalahari Desert, the Cone, or to the Amazon Basin, the Machu Guanga, from all over the planet, there seems to be these invisible connections between people and their tools. And this is steeped in our stories. King Arthur was the only person who could put his hand on, this, on Excalibur and pull it out of the stone. There was some connection between him and that thing. And it's that connection that we're interested in. So the book is about how Humans perceive the world of useful things, and how and why we act in the orderly way that we do regarding them. It's that regularity that we want to have an answer for and get an understanding about how it works. Now, if you go to your favorite department at campus, you might hear some very different takes on what property is. If you go to the humanities department, you'll hear that property is violence, it's theft, it constitutes serious political speech, it's the cause of wars and quarrels in the world, and it might be a modern Western European construction. If you go to a biology department, you're going to hear a very different story. So this is a picture of a red squirrel. His hair is pushed up, puffed out, because he's aggressive. He wants to make himself look bigger and send some whoever he's looking at away from him. He's protecting his, his larder um, that he's cached in a particular area here, and he's going to defend this quite aggressively and quite uh, impressively to the little thing that he is. So while I'm sorry, like, the squirrels have property in the trees in the, in the backyards of, of the, that, that they work in. And they might bring up scrub jays. This is a picture of a scrub jay pecking and hiding food and rehiding this food. So scrub jays have this feature where that if another one is watching while this bird is hiding its food, it will then, once the other bird flies away, rehide it so as to avoid it being stolen. And so that's the language that the bodies use to kind of protect against theft. So this, this bird and species has a way of protecting itself against theft. If you talk to them about baboons, it seems very apparent that male baboons who have harems of females will respect the females of another harem and not have to try to entice them away. So it looks like they have property over their own mates and, and they respect that. There are pictures of dolphins who have Spanish mackerel prey, which is very prized by them, in their mouths. And it looks like all the other dolphins, from our perspective, think it belongs to the dolphin who has the, the Spanish mackerel in their mouth. So there's all these examples from the animal kingdom where it looks like animals have property. Now, 
if you ask the social scientists and the legal scholars in the middle, they tend to dabble in both of these kind of theories. They'll say, yeah, my dog has property in the toys. He guards them, he doesn't want anyone else to have them. And they might also say, well, Native Americans did not have notions of property like their European conquerors did. So they're kind of taking from both, both, both courts. And so this is what motivates the entire project, is to understand just what is property. Because the biologists think it's all over the animal kingdom, and other scholars think it's just some people in one part of the world that have property. So what do they mean by property? What, is there a way to reconcile this? And what about these social scientists who just kind of pick things in the middle? And so those are the two motivating questions. What is property? And why does our species happen to happen? I'm going to propose a compromise to these two pedestrian positions that's going to go right down the middle and like most compromises make no one happy. And that is, I'm going to claim that property is a universal and uniquely human custom. So, for the people in the humanities, they're going to be unhappy with this idea that property is universal. But if you ask anthropologists who study many different groups of people, there does seem to be the sense that every human group has property in at least some set of tools, utensils, and ornaments. Other people, Western peoples, have property in a lot of things. Tools, land, you put property in ideas now. But the claim is that there's some small set, no matter what human group you go to, that they will have some kind of property in, the, in, a, in a tool. And it's backed up by some work by some linguists who study these basic concepts that are in every single language that they have studied. And one of those concepts is mine. In every human language you can say, this thing is mine. And you can't put it any simpler than that. This, whatever the word is in another language, means this. And mine means mine, and thing means thing. Now, when you can say that, and what are the circumstances that's possible, you're going to vary a lot around the world. But that concept is there between any two human beings on the planet who communicate. And for that, I think, gives us pretty good evidence to think about that property is going to be universal in some form. Now, the biologists will be unhappy with this claim that it's uniquely human. Now, one of the things that's common to all those examples I gave you, that, people, that other animals have property in food, mates, in territory, is that they don't have to be taught to protect their larger horde. They don't have to be taught as a wolf to mark their territory. These things are instinctual, it's part of their genetics that they, that they have these behaviors and they act them out when they get to the appropriate age and circumstances. But think about how property works with humans and with our kids. Kids also grab everything they can in their hands, they'll call them mine, and no one has to teach them that word. They learn that word all on their own. No one puts a little thing in their hand and says, no, say mine, say mine. And they get upset when you pull it out. No, no, no. They get upset all on their own. Dispossession is something they are quite familiar with and quite unhappy with when they learn that their parents they can't claim everything they want as mine. So we teach our kids the rules of when they and how they can acquire things. And we do it with another abstract concept found in every single language, and that is not. In every language you can say no. And that's exactly how we teach property to every generation of kids. And every generation of kids has to learn it. So it seems that this is not, uh, has, that it's got to be passed on, that it is a custom. So that's the last part of my claim here, that property is a universally uniquely human custom, that only humans pass this kind of behavior on. Now, philosophers and legal scholars and Economists wouldn't first grab for custom as their word to describe property. I think the word that would come up with would be rights.
But rights as a concept is only so old. And if it's truly a uniquely human disposition to have, have act with property, then I think we have to have something more basic that goes further back in human history to understand this phenomenon of how humans deal with things in a regular way. And so I would argue that custom is the foundation of it, and it's at the core of how we understand property works. Now, you might say, well, how is custom going to return my stolen bicycle? And I would say, well, call the police and see what happens. Nothing happens. And that nothing happens in no way helps us understand why millions of bikes go unstolen. It isn't the right that's enforced by the government that creates property. It's got to be something in our core that reflects in what the government does. There's something more basic at the heart of it. And that's what I want to explore with you tonight, that part of it. I'm going to talk about how property is a way of thinking. Because it is a custom, it is a way of thinking about how we want to interact with each other regarding things. And that it's a lot more complex and a lot more marvelous than I think we take for granted. And lastly, property is unilateral. It requires reciprocal relationship. Property is not just my two-year-old two saying, mine. It needs something else, and it needs other people for it to actually be a custom. So, to act, I'm going to try to answer this question now of why humans have property by taking the biologist kind of perspective and their pushback and pose the question this way. How did, if it really is property all over the animal kingdom, then how is it in evolutionary history that a genetically scheduled behavior regarding food, mates, and territory of non-humans, somehow in our history, gradually became a socially taught and learned custom concerning how not to acquire things, and things that are not just food, territory, or mates. How did that happen? Because property didn't just somehow, some way, make this leap. And I think if we get disentangled and kind of go back as far as we can, we can shake out that this shake out what happened, because my answer is it didn't happen that way. And the actual way that property came to the human species is through this idea of tools and tool use. And why is that important? Because tool use is something that's socially taught as well. So uh, tool use in primates is going to be my connection. Somehow there's got to be something different going on. Chimpanzees and capuchins and all and all the rest of the great apes that gets us to what happens with humans in property. Now tool use itself is common in the animal kingdom. We used to think very pridefully that you know, only humans have tools. But if you look carefully, digger wasp will take up a pebble and, and knock with it. Ants will use leaves to carry water from there to their nest. Badgers will push plant matter over, over the holes to make sure that their gopher prey come out in the right spot. And corvids, these, these um, magnificent birds you probably see pictures on in your news feed, have really marvelous ways of getting shaping a tool to get food out of a particular uh, tube in the, in the, the, that experimenters put up with them. It's simply amazing what they can imagine in their minds and then create in order to pull out. But there's no evidence at this point that any of that use of tools is socially taught. It all comes from them instinctual until you get to the primate order. And so socially transmitted tools are all over the primate order. And they're using not just like a pebble to knock, they're going to use associative tools. What do I mean by that? So the most sophisticated tool outside humans on the planet is this hammer and anvil tools, where capuchins and chimpanzees have to find a flat rock. They're going to put a nut on it. So there's one physical relationship. They're going to find another stone. 
hold it on top, and let it go. That's a second physical relationship. That's a lot for a lot of animal minds to hold in their, in, in their brains. Now, it's not even that easy, because if you get too heavy a rock on the wrong nut, you'll crush it, you won't get any of the meat inside. And if you get a too light a rock and you drop on it, it'll just bounce off, you won't get anything. And so there's evidence that juveniles are really bad at this in the wild. So that's our evidence that is socially taught, that as they get older, they get better at it. And in fact, primatologists have observed juveniles pulling mentors, older members of the community by to show them how to do it and figure it out. So there's social transmission from generation to generation of how to crack nuts with these stones. And it's part of this tool, tool process. But what happens when we use a tool? It becomes part of what my body by itself cannot do. It is an extension of my person. So I want to think about what happens when I use my tools. Imagine you have a cane, and you close your eyes and you're tapping around, and you hit the leg of a table. What do you feel? You feel the table through the cane. Even though the actual vibrations are the handle in your palm, your mind extends itself out into the cane and feel the tip hitting the leg. It's part of you. You are in the cane. And the question is, what happens if I have a spear and I lay it down? Am I still in it? So there is an eye and a body, where if you take this body and you haul it off, I go with it. You take that spear and you haul it off, is the piece of me still in there? The notion of mine, is it still in there? And I would say yes, if I have property in it. That's what human beings are doing. We take a physical thing and we give it new characteristics. It's not just this flat thing, that something else is going on, we, care, we, we give it new characteristics. And think of what's possible, like even with kids. So imagine a girl comes into her primary school classroom and she comes with her Hello Kitty mittens and she hangs them on her hook. And then it's time to go out for recess and there's a pair of Hello Kitty mittens on the floor. And the teacher says, whose are those? Whose mittens are these? And if that kid who brought the mittens in and hung them on the, on, the, on, the hang, on the hook can see both pairs, and even though they may be identical, that kid is not going to claim the ones on the floor. Try that with any other animal. To claim physically identical things because that have different characteristics. They think of it different. It has a history. It's what the pair on the hooks is mine. And that's the power that gets property off the ground. The other part that makes it work is that we have to use words. So we, the biologists like to compare like effects across animals. You know, no animal dog doesn't like to have its toy pulled out of its mouth. Kids don't like to have their toys pulled out of their hands. They all resist that disposition. But that's not the essence of property. I'm interested in looking at property in its origins, in our perceptions of the very things themselves. And when we say words, when we have these vocalizations, we change how we perceive the very physical world in front of us. And when I say this thing is mine, this, the world is different. And it has to use that language. So just having a growl is not the same thing. That's that's not putting some characteristic on into the thing. That's just saying, be careful, I see, I see a competitor, I'm ready to fight. And this process then takes words and things to create this special category through this unique idea of mine, such that I can say about something, it is mine. And it also then requires people to know that what I say is true. So it's not just me. Otherwise, all of us are just claiming mine out there like any other animal's claiming things out there. And then we decide we check each other out and we get into a fight if we think that we have the advantage. 
But that's not what property is knowing of it. We're using people to know that when I say these words, that something is true about the world. And it means then now that other people cannot simultaneously say about the very same thing, it is mine. It's the force of meaning that produces a perceptual, a perceptual change in the actual physical world. And when we do that, I'm arguing that we do this in a very regular way all around the world. That is physically contained in the thing, and I'm arguing that the evidence of that is in our language. So here's an example from the, from the 16th century, but I've been able to trace it back to um, earlier, 300 some years before this, um, in other, in Latin, in, in other particular languages, but I'll to use a, a different case here. And so, uh, the case of the swans. So, in, in, the fifth, in the late 1500s, Queen Elizabeth wanted to have a big uh, feast. She, she instructed her keeper of the swans, it's a physician, to go out and get 400 swans from the Thames. Grabbed 400 of them, had a feast, and, and Lady Joan Young did not like that because the, time, the, the swans in the Thames also went into her private estuaries. And now all of a sudden the queen kind of wiped out 400 of them in one fell swoop. So she took the queen to court. And Sir Robert Cook then summarizes how this case went down. And here are some of examples of the lines he used in the case. I think there are about eight of these throughout the thing, in a very short case. Explaining how it would be resolved. That everyone who has swans in his manor, that is to say within his private waters, hath a property in them. For the red trespass was a wrongful taking of swans. A man hath not absolute property in anything which is wild, but in those things which are domestic. He uses this phrase, property in the thing. I argue that what the choice of proposition there was to reflect and reveal how their mind was thinking about how property works. That they put it in the thing. He doesn't always use that. Sometimes he uses the phrase, property of a swan. But in this example, it's not about who has property, but the fact that it is a feature of swans that somebody can have property of it, we don't know who it is. And that's what the preposition of does. And so I want to convince you of that, of just some basic work about how prepositions work. So uh, Andrea Tyler and Vivian Evans have a model of English prepositions, where every preposition has some spatial relationship between two entities, and there's some functional element that reflects their interactive relationship between those two entities. What do I mean by that? Here's their example. He ran to the hills versus he ran for the hills. Change one little word, but the two sentences mean two very different things. Because the word, the word to is a pointer. It's about somebody running and they're going to the hills. It's that kind of movement. But if guns are ablaze in the street, somebody runs for the hills. And it's not about that linear movement, it's about the reasons why somebody is getting the hell out of Dodge. That's what for does. It's oblique and it's about intentions. So little words like prepositions matter. So what does that mean for our preposition I'm interested in? In. Well, in has two things, a 3D thing, it has a boundary, an interior and an exterior, and there's a functional relationship between those two things, the water and the uh, bottle, that has containment. So think of the tea as in the cup. Where the cup goes, so goes the tea. It's quite physical. Now, in can become a little more metaphorical. You wouldn't say that out here, but in my home state of Wisconsin, you would say the cow is in the pasture. That's plainer than the cow is in the middle. But because the cow doesn't get out of the pasture, we use the preposition the cow is in the pasture. So our mind is using our metaphorical extract powers to kind of use that in to do some other kind of work. And it gets even more abstract. We say the cow is in heat. Every 21 days, there's for 18 hours, the cow is going to be in estrus, and there's no way it can get out of it. It's contained. It's kind of stuck in estrus. Now, 
Not every language will use the same prepositions. I'm not claiming that this use of in is universal. What I'm claiming is that it reflects how we think about it. So the British will say, the cow is on heat. Why? Because on captures a different element of estrus in a cow, namely that it's short. And we have it in phrases like, we go on vacation, and Aaron Rodgers is on fire. Unfortunately, Aaron Rodgers isn't always on fire, and family vacations end, which is why we use that preposition on. But what I'm saying is when the English did choose this concept, use this word in, they were using it for that physical containment. It's that physical containment that gets some pretty exciting things off the ground, and why property is the foundation of economics. Because if I think about this thing, and I say, this is not mine, this is yours, and you say the same thing about something else, we've now changed those things. <laughs> Even though it's the same physical thing, but how we perceive them has changed. And we have now just exchanged them. And no other animal exchanged one thing for another thing. Why? Because they have no idea of the concept of mine, and they don't have the concept of yours, which is derivative of mine. Yours is, you can say about it, this is mine. And it's that physical containing within the thing that makes that possible. Because where this goes, your property goes in it. And all I have to do is say some words and change how you think about the world. And no other animal can recall concepts at will and then use it to affect how somebody else thinks about the very world itself. That's the beautiful thing about how property works. So, in the time that I'm remaining, I want to get to the point of why we have it. Why do we have property? So, uh, Aristotle recognize that there can be four different kinds of answers to any question called why. There are four different kind of causes that might explain what's going on. And so the material explanation for property, why do we have this customer property, is that when our body sees, hears, and touches the physical world, it connects a certain person to a certain thing by classifying the thing as mine. And that physical thing is what is necessary to really think about how property works and differentiates us from the rest of the animal. And this means that I'm making a distinction between I want this and this is mine. So chimpanzees will point to things and they'll like wonder bread and grapes, these quick sweet things like anything else, to point at it and basically say, I want this thing. But saying I want this is not the same thing as this is mine. And even more beautiful is that when I say this is mine, I am counting on you to respect that. That means I'm relying on you to say this is yours. And if by a dictates of equality, no one is better than anyone else, then if there are things about which I can say this is mine, there are things about which you can say this is mine. And that mine and yours have to go together. And that's why property is not just one person feeling and thinking this is mine. There is an abstract similarity to any way you think about property in any human group. And so the formal abstract notion of property is that people learn from their mentors under the circumstances in which someone can say, this thing is mine. People can know that, that what this person says is true, and other people cannot say, this thing is mine. And that can vary from things around the world. It might not be the same things, but it always has that same form in every community about a, perhaps a very small set of things or maybe a large set of things, but it has that common form. And it's that form that I would argue that then will lead to these more macro concepts of rights. But it starts with this idea of property in the mind and in a community. The efficient explanation is that humans have the cost of a property because when someone severs our connection to a certain thing, we resent the harm and injury we feel, 
and we attempt to defend ourselves by beating back the injury with some injury in return. Those of you who have read the theory of moral sentiments, that's inspired English straight out of the theory of moral sentiments. And this is kind of controversial because you're basing property on this odious sentiment of resentment. But that is what gets property off the ground because if you take this thing out of my hand and I get upset, people who think I can say and know it's true, I can say this is mine, are going to join me in my resentment. And we're going to go after that person and beat back that injury with some of our, of our own. Now that person might also bring his buddies along and now we have a real problem. And that's why human beings are the only species to delegate it to conflicts to a third party. But it's this idea that we get upset and we're going to create damage that we have to solve because if we get hurt ourselves, we're less likely to survive. Now this is a common feature throughout the animal kingdom. Yeah. So a sow bear is going to come after you if you're standing between her and her cubs. And if you poke it, it's definitely going to come after you. So there's resentment in the animal kingdom in that kind of sense. But we also have in the animal kingdom ways of getting ourselves out so we don't damage ourselves. So bucks will have these kind of elaborate little dances they play, sizing each other up. So that they know that if I look I'm a little weaker than that one, we're not actually going to fight. And that's what property is. It's getting off the ground. How can we avoid us getting upset with resentment in creating these problems? And why do we have to solve that problem? Because the final explanation of property is that we are a species which is often malicious, insolent, and easily provoked, and as powerful affecting mischief as it is ready in designing it when resources are scarce. Property is about peace. It's about coming up with rules and expectations so that we don't get into fights. And that is why we come up with all these elaborate rules and why um, kind of the whole custom gets off the ground. It's a way of keeping peace in the community. And so property doesn't make us do bad things. And I would argue that that is what the uh, story of Naboth in the vineyard is all about. So, King Ahab is out looking on his, over his kingdom, he looks over nearby, and Naboth has a vineyard that he really, really likes. Naboth comes home, he sulks to his wife Jezebel, I really want that vineyard, but the title that Naboth has is pretty solid. And what does Jezebel do? She says, King up here, Naboth, Ahab, if you're the alpha, do something about it. Ahab doesn't do anything about it, so Jezebel does something about it and has Naboth killed so that King Ahab can acquire it. Naboth, I mean, excuse me, Ahab failed Naboth in respecting that is mine, and he failed Jezebel. He didn't have the self command to tell Jezebel that, that this is not mine, and it's not mine to take as we'd like. And so it's an ethical character that makes property work. To be the kind of person who respects that what is mine is mine, but what is yours is also yours. And that I can't just go and grab things and take things as I would like them. Property doesn't make us do bad things. It's our human nature, us as fallible beings, that make us do bad things. Property isn't the cause of wars and quarrels in the world. It was designed to solve those contentions. Thank you.